Okay, this sermon is entitled, Sinless Perfectionism is a Ticket to Hell. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Now, there are a bunch of people out there that teach this garbage, and this teaching is the most embarrassing, foolish, demonic, ridiculous, absurd, ludicrous, asinine, retarded, stupid, just unbelievable teaching out there. And I don't understand how any person would fall for this garbage and actually think that this teaching is correct. And this is the teaching that claims that a person, and I don't really know how all these different false teachers would quantify this, because I'm pretty sure it's different for, every, for everybody, but they basically say that you can come to a point in your life where you no longer sin. And I don't know how any saved person could think like this. In fact, they, they can't. It's impossible. The only people that would believe something like this is somebody who's demonically possessed and who's, who's going to hell. Now, let me go to a few, t- a few verses that they go to in order to try to back this teaching up. But the teaching is absurd, it's not possible, and the only people that believe this garbage are people that are spiritually blind to the point of being delusional. And I'm going to prove to you right now that even if these people were correct, they would still go to hell. So let's take a look at a couple verses they go to. Matthew chapter 5, they go to verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, first of all, he's speaking to the publicans, he's speaking to certain a certain group of people. And this is basically to let them know that according to their system, okay, they wanted to be back under basically the law, and if you just jump back into the, some of the earlier parts of the, of the uh, scripture here, we see this, and if you want to be under the law, the point of this is that you have to be perfect. He's not telling sinners, he's not telling the unsaved how to be, how to be saved here. He's just saying, well, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, let me elucidate what that would be. Perfection, according to this verse, would be you have the same ability as God to create the whole universe. That's one example. And you are perfectly without sin. You've never sinned at all. You would have to be co-equal with Christ, and you would have to basically die on the cross. And the point is is that nobody is perfect, and that's why we need to be saved. Now, let's go to another verse they use. And we're saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone, they don't believe that. They believe you're saved through your, perf- your own perfection, your self-perfecting. And it's just a bunch of nonsense. I'm, I'm going to prove to you that these people couldn't be saved even if they were perfect. And that's why this is a ticket to hell. Okay, John chapter 8. Here's another verse they use. Verse 11. She said, No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, first of all, there's no proof that she actually did abstain or abnegate from sinning at this point. Second of all, it's a certain type of sin. And third, the exhortation to not sin is stated after the assertion that the woman was no longer condemned. Now, that's the order. You get saved, then you're, and you're no longer condemned. And then telling somebody to go and sin no more is just like a, an encouragement. It would be like, you know, let's say you have a, a child who's taking martial arts. He's taking um, Taekwondo. And you tell him, go out and get your black belt. Okay? It's nothing wrong with, with making that exhortation. Now, it has nothing to do with whether or not the person actually fulfills, you know, the command. He's just telling them, go and sin no more. Now, these sinless perfection idiots would try to say that you have to stop sinning. And, there you, and there's their verse, their, their so-called proof text. But see, the thing is, is that nobody is without sin. And now I'm going to prove to you that these people are going to hell because based on their own standard, they fail. Okay, turn over to 1 John chapter 1. See, the reason why these people fail and the reason why this teaching is so demonic is because the people who teach, who teach it are making the rules. They're setting the standard. They're creating the paradigm for how a person has to so-called live, and it's based on a redefinition of sin and an attenuation of sin, conceptually speaking. And I've met people that actually taught this junk, and what they do is they just take the certain sins that they're guilty of, and they try to say, that's not a sin. And that's all these people are doing. Because if you're honest about yourself, the Bible makes it clear that we've, we come short of the glory of God in everything we do. And that's why 
you don't want to adhere or subscribe to this teaching at all because this teaching is blasphemous because it trumps what the Bible says. It trumps God's word. And these people are basically deciding or playing God. They have a God complex, and they are deciding what's right and wrong. And it's whatever they say that goes. When the Bible makes it clear that if we know to do something right and we don't do it, it's a sin. So there is nobody that's without sin, and anyone who says they are, let me show you what these people are guilty of. They're guilty of four things, and, and, he, and it's funny how these things are sins. Just to say that you don't sin is a sin, okay? You're, you, and according to your system, you'd be going to hell just for saying that, okay? First John chapter 1, let me just show you what these people are guilty of and why they can't be saved through this. And the only reason they believe this is because they're not saved. See, the real issue is, is what does the Bible say? The Bible says that everyone's a sinner, and then everyone is a sinner continually, even after they're saved. But see, if you don't believe that, it's because you don't believe the Bible. And not believing the Bible is what a lost person does. They don't believe the Word of God. And that's why only a deceived, deluded, unsaved, unregenerate person who is minus or lacking the Holy Spirit would ever believe this. Okay? The Bible says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay? Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay? There's four things these people are guilty of. Number one, deceiving themselves. Okay? Number two, not having the truth in them. Number three, okay, they're making God a liar. They're calling God a liar. That sounds like a sin. Okay? And then they're guilty of not having his word in them, which proves they're lost and going to hell. Okay? And see, the thing is, is that these people, they think they don't sin, but and they might, they might even believe they don't sin, but guess what? Nobody else believes it. And the only way you could actually fool somebody into th- thinking that you don't sin is if you hide you know, like a recluse from the rest of the world, and you have no communication with anybody. And then we might be able to think that, hey, that person doesn't sin, and I still don't believe it, and I don't think anyone with their with their head on straight believes it either. And, and nobody who has the Holy Spirit inside them believes it, because these people are nothing but a bunch of stupid, unsaved, hell-bound liars. And that's all this teaching does, is damn people to hell, because they're not trusting in Jesus Christ to pay for all their sins. They're trusting in themselves. They're trying to be their own self-savior, and they're trying to, you know, eradicate or extinguish the sin in their own life, thinking that's going to work when it's not. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. You can quit sinning altogether and never sin again, if you, even if you could. You could you'd still go to hell, because that's not what saves, okay? What saves is the blood of Jesus Christ. What saves is God's grace, God's free grace. So these people are damned if they do. Let's just say they do stop sinning. They do reach perfection. They're still damned. And then they're damned if they don't because they're just a sinner without a savior either way. And sinless perfectionism is nothing but a ticket to hell. And that's why people need to renounce it, relinquish this garbage, this self-righteous, prideful, stupid idiocy and lunacy and madness, and they need to trust in Jesus Christ alone. He died. He was buried. He rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's it. Faith alone in Christ alone. You're saved forever, eternally secure, and all your sins are washed away. And guess what? Now you have his perfection on your account, not your own. Okay? So that's the issue. The people who are saved, we have God's righteousness. The people who are unsaved and trusting in this sinless perfection stupidity, they have their own righteousness, and their righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and they're going to drop into hell and burn forever. That's all there is to it. So now I'd like to, before I close, just compare the nomenclature or the rhetoric of some of the characters in the Bible when they were making an admission of their sinfulness to some of the random and maybe generalized quotes I've heard from these sinless perfection people. Now, I've heard sinless perfection people say that they walk, you know, in perfect holiness with God. I've heard them say stuff like that, or they no longer sin anymore. Well, let's compare that to Psalm 38 in verse 4. Obviously, this is David. It says, For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as an heavy burden they are too heavy for me. Okay? We have the unsaved not admitting that they're a sinner, acting like they don't sin, but then we have the saved David admitting just how bad he is. Okay, let's turn over to Psalm 40, verse 12. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. Okay, they are more than the hairs of mine head, therefore my heart faileth me. See, this is the truth about sin. Now, let's turn over to the New Testament. 
Let's go to the classic example of the Pharisee and the publican and see the Pharisee represents the sinless perfectionist. The publican represents a sinner. Now, before I read this, I'd like to go ahead and just point out that the simple fact that these people won't admit they're a sinner and that they hold to or they embrace this fantastical notion that they don't sin is actually proof that these card-carrying, dyed-in-the-wool, hardcore, sinless perfectionists are absolutely not saved. See, we have the example right here. It says in verse 11, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. What he's doing is he's basically superciliously bragging about what he does and what he doesn't do, okay? And this is nothing but quintessential self-righteousness. This would, like I said, represent the sinless perfectionist, okay? And verse 13 represents just a sinner who's going to be saved by grace. It reads, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself, that would be the sinless perfectionist, shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So that's the one thing that these people lack, is humility. They won't admit that they're a wicked sinner like everybody else, because that would just basically just destroy their pride and destroy their doctrine. And the Bible says which one went down justified... It's the one who actually admits they're a sinner and doesn't try to perfect himself, which is nothing but an abortive waste of time because you'll never be perfect. That's the point. And this teaching is, is just flat retarded, it's demonic, and it just totally flies in the face of what the Bible teaches. It's like a cat trying not to be a cat or a dog trying not to be a dog. It's never going to happen. And the whole endeavor becomes very reminiscent of chasing rainbows. And basically, you have... One of two outcomes with this, whenever you're trying to perfect yourself in the flesh. Number one, you fail, you meet defeat, and then you realize that you can't do it. So you turn to God and His grace. Or number two, you become a puffed up, hubristic, pharisaical, prideful, self-righteous jerk. That's all you get. There's no third option. And either way, you're still just a sinner, either with grace or without grace. And you don't get grace if you're trying to earn it, if you're trying to be perfect. You only get grace by faith alone in Christ alone. So salvation, biblically speaking, is a free gift. The believer has a free ticket to heaven. But the sinless perfectionist, who has not trusted in God's grace, who has not trusted in the finished work of the cross, they have a free ticket to hell. And see, the thing is, is that after we get saved, we should strive to be holy. We should strive to serve God. But we have to understand that it'll never be good enough. It'll never be perfect. So that's why we are saved by grace and nothing else. That's all I have. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.